When I was a child, I thought I would be a writer, and that basically informs everything that I do. So the narrative of my life, the narrative of what's, what happens to me every day, it's imperative that I translate that into my work. And I thought, well, you know, I guess you make those decisions about what choices you have in life. And my choice was that I had to um, somehow propel myself from the, the confusion about why I was alive, because that's something that I ask every day, to working, which helps you deal with being alive. And so uh, it's been a very interesting thing, because I, I never had to put any limits onto what I was doing. So my job is to go out, look at the world, collect information, and then come back and make some sense and nonsense out of it, and then give it back to you, hopefully with some kind of poignancy and some kind of humor that allows you to do, well, to allows you to do whatever you do with it. So when Rick and I did New Yorkistan, it was a few months after 9-11, um, and we were on our way to a party, and which is a, a, an odd thing to begin with, and started talk, we were going through the Bronx, and we started talking about, well, where are we? And we said, well, we're in, and, and, the, and we were, of course, talking about the tragedy and how in, in incredible it was that we didn't know any of these tribes, or I didn't know any of them anyway, and so, we started saying we were in Bronxistan, and then no, we, then we were in, um, you know, I don't know where we were in other places, in the khakis and the car keys on our way to Connecticut. And so we started making a list, and by the time we came back to New York, we had, I don't know how many, 100, 100 names, maybe more, which we sent to the New Yorker. And uh, it was one of those things that, it, we, if we had tried to do it, it probably wouldn't have happened. It, something, it, it was a spontaneous moment of, you have to really be who you are to be who you are and allow yourself to be who you are. So we were, we were allowing ourselves to make fun of this uh, you know, catastrophic moment and, and episode in life and, um, and, it, and it enabled us to, well, somehow to enable people somehow to begin to deal with it on one level, you know. One of the favorite things that I've ever done is Illustrating the Elements of Style by Strunk and White. And that book is an extraordinary example of something that's very crazy and very funny and is a staple of American you know, um, education. So, but I, having gone to NYU, but basically never going to class and just busy doing other things that seemed much more important to me, I was an English major and I never even heard of the elements of style. So it, was, so it tells you like what kind of really scholar I am. So when um, Rick and I were on the Cape one summer and I picked up this, this copy of, I, I collect a lot of language books and, and the, the phrases and things and dictionaries, so I picked up this copy and I said, this is an amazing book. People should know about this book. And, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to illustrate it. And so it took a few years to convince the Strunk Estate. And it became something that was really a wonderful project to do. And then while I was working, I was singing the words in the, in the, the sentences, which were so hilarious. And then I thought, well, it's really important that we have an opera based on this book. So. I knew a wonderful composer named Nico Muley, who I had met when he was 12 years old when we were living in Rome. And he was this brilliant child which, who, who became a brilliant composer. And so he and I were able to create this musical composition. It was a song cycle that was performed at the main reading room of the public library for musicians and for non-musicians. So there was the omit needless words orchestra where we played with buttons and typewriters and clattering teacups and saucers as a counterpoint to real musicians who were singing in this room that you're only supposed to be quiet in. And it was such a glorious experience because it became, you know, to illustrate something and then to take it from, from that narrative to music and then to perform, um, it was really an example of, well, why would you not want to do everything you possibly can? Of course, I, I painted not the grammatical uh, explanations because I didn't even understand half of them, but I painted the sentences. So, you know, like this one is, none of us is perfect. And it's just, it was the ability to, to digress, to be episodic, to be um, non-sequential and inconsequential, and to just to completely uh, address a specific idea and then jump to the next. And you know, for me, it would be fun to illustrate the encyclopedia or the dictionary because I'm not a great fan of plots, and I don't really, I don't embrace the idea of a plot or a, you know, or a literal narrative. So one day, a package arrives for me that somebody leaves in my in my building, and it's a 
a package tied with linen and wrapped with a page from a newspaper. And there's a photo of a man lying dead in the snow. That's the photo on the newspaper. And I'm hoping that he is not dead, just enjoying a refreshing lie down in the snow. But the caption sadly says that he is dead. And the man is Robert Walser. He was a writer at the turn of the last century, uh, a Swiss writer who wrote a, maybe like six or eight books, something like that. He started out being a, a servant. He went to servant school and he became a servant. And then he started writing and, and he, he befriended these two sisters. But his sanity started to elude him. And he fell apart and he ended up living in a mental institution for the last 25 years of his life, which is not the only reason that, that I, you know, I'm fond of him, but I mean, that's, that's a big one. And um, so he moved, you know, he, but he moved from rooming house to rooming house and, uh, you know, how many car doors did he walk down and how many rooms and how many times did he pack and unpack? And this is, and this is a photo of one of the hotels that he stayed in. And this is a photo of him in bed. So he wasn't unknown. There were people who knew about him. He did, he did achieve some kind of success in his life, but basically it, it, it went nowhere. And um, he loved to walk. And one of the things that, that, I, that I love to do is I love to walk. And he wrote, he wrote a short story, well, it's a novella called The Walk, about the nature of walking, which is really, really important to me, and I talk about it a lot in my work, that um, to have a sense of curiosity, to have a sense of optimism, to have a sense that there's you know, meaning and delight in work usually is generated for me by taking a walk. And that the things that happen is that you walk and you don't think and you don't, um, you're really just observing and looking and allowing your brain to empty. And I think that I usually say that my greatest goal and my greatest achievement is to have an empty brain because that means that I'm actually allowing new ideas to flood into my brain in a way that you can't force. <laughs>